So, the 1985 Statistical Abstract of the United States Census Bureau, yes, I read it regularly, says that there were 2,230 colleges in 1965 and 3,026 just 10 years later, most of them built in part with great society funds. College enrollment went from 6 million to 11 million. In addition, the abstract tells us that the death rate from major cardiovascular diseases fell from 340 to 246 per 100,000 from 1970 to 1981. The abstract attributed the decrease in part to the value of the government's heart cancer stroke program of 1965, again, funded with Great Society funds. On the other hand, Jason Riley, editor, uh, editorial writer of the Wall Street Journal, argues in his book, Stop Helping Us, that liberal initiatives intended to assist poor minorities have hurt them more than they have helped. Government welfare programs helped wreck the nuclear family and make economic independence undesirable, he says. Minimum wage laws priced inexperienced youths out of the job market. And affirmative action either benefited minorities who were already academically qualified or put academically unqualified minorities into rigorous schools where they struggled to succeed. The scriptures command us to aid the poor, but what's the best way to do that? Here to help us answer this perennial question is Mary Frances Schurlimer with her thesis, To Haiti with Good Intentions, Reforming Poverty Alleviation. Mary Frances. Thank you for introducing me, Mr. McKenna. Today, the existence of organizations like yours is offensive to Mexico. I wanted to make this statement in order to explain to you why I feel sick about it all, and in order to make you aware that good intentions have not much to do with what we are discussing here. To hell with good intentions. You will not help anyone by your good intentions. I am here to suggest that you voluntarily renounce giving up the power that being an American gives you. I'm here to entreat you to give up the legal right you have to impose your benevolence on Mexico. I'm here to challenge you to recognize your inability your powerlessness, and your incapacity to do the good which you intended to do. I'm here to entreat you to use your money, your status, and your education to travel in Latin America. Come to look, come to climb our mountains, to enjoy our flowers, come to study, but do not come to help. Prior to a speech given in 1968, these words were spoken to a group of American college students on their way to Cuernavaca, Mexico. The speaker, Ivan Illich, was a member of the organization Volunteer Bolivia. The team was on their way to, quote, help Mexican peasants develop by spending a few months in their villages, end quote. They were to build homes, build wells, bring goods, all in an attempt to bring the village community to a more productive state of being. The missionaries came believing that they could eliminate the problems that the Mexican people had with their American illusionary qualifications. The team may have provided the indigent people with material aid like food, wells, and other supplies but they were not looking to repair their broken spirits. They did not see the spiritual disorientation. They did not hear the desperate cry for the good news. They were not coming on an equal ground of sin, but were coming to unintentionally fill a resume and impose their benevolence on Mexico. The idealistic college students expected an inspiring, positive, and reassuring message. However, they received a much more frank and convicting speech, a picture of poverty alleviation gone wrong. Illich is right in a way. We alone, as fragmented humans, cannot fix the problems of humanity.
We can, however, be used by God to begin to mend the broken relationships on this broken earth. Regarding this dilemma, many North American missionaries and relief programs believe that providing material aid is the most practical and effective way to alleviate poverty. Many affirm this because of their misconception of what poverty is. They presuppose it to be solely a lack of material goods. Therefore, the best way to alleviate the problem is to replenish the quality and amount of the goods. However, I am here to support the argument that cultural renewal is a more humane approach to poverty alleviation than mere material aid. This means addressing present sin and broken relationships within communities before bombarding them with goods. This means lovingly teaching people how to use their gifts for the glory of God, be, excuse me, for the glory of God and equipping them with the tools to sustain themselves. It is essential to understand that all men, poor or rich, are created equally in the image of God. Men, culture, art, relationships, and society were created to live and function holistically. I will explain how sin is a root cause of poverty. I will also explain how spiritual and moral renewal is therefore the root solution, and the restoration of the whole man holistically in all institutions, associations, beliefs, and customs. God vividly provides the answer to how all men are to be equally viewed. Genesis 1.27 reads, So God created man in his own image. God formed us in the womb to be fully functional image bearers and dynamic culture creators. In the beginning, Adam lived peacefully among God's creation in the garden with all the animals it held within. This peace that inhabited the earth operated off of a foundation of serenity within each and every relationship that man was involved in. Shalom was ever present. Shalom is a Hebrew word that means wholeness, peace, prosperity, health, and harmony. Men, culture, art, relationships, and society were created to live and function holistically as one unit. Until we identify poverty's root, we cannot thoroughly eradicate it from a community. The root cause of poverty is sin. Let me be clear in saying that sin is not always a direct cause of poverty, although that is very much possible as well as common. One example of sin being a root cause of poverty is laziness. Lazy instincts restrain man from working to the best of his abilities and therefore disabling him to potentially getting jobs. Yet not just a lack of energy or effort, it is a refusal to postpone gratification, an unwillingness to work hard even when there is no immediate fruit of one's labor. When one refuses to work or put forth any, le any level of effort, he starts to misuse his abilities and miserably fail to appreciate what his Father in Heaven gave him from birth. Poverty tempts particular sins such as dishonesty, specifically stealing. Although we may believe this to be a byproduct of poverty, it also causes it. Not only is the employer affected, but also each employee and his family, as well as the person unlawfully taking the goods. Also, sexual immorality fuels broken relationships, which create broken communities, ultimately resulting in poverty. Laziness, stealing, and sexual immorality are all critical causes of poverty, but false theological beliefs are the consuming umbrella that encompasses them all. For example, idolatry, paganism, karma, and other forms of rejection of God ignite poverty. One example being the unclean in India. The unclean are declared untouchable from first breath. No matter what they do, whether their parents were declared unclean from bad karma or of an unclean profession such as the leather industry, they are heartlessly rejected from society. The unclean, also known as the Dalits, are left to fend for themselves. Hindus believe that they cannot and should not help the Dalits and are therefore helping them pay off the consequences of their actions from past lives. Because of this false theological belief, 167 million Dalits, 
That is 76 times the Houston population are presently living indigently in appalling slums, being rejected by society, and barely holding on to life itself. This pain, this hurt, this disorientation all stems from a separation from God, that which man created, resulting in all existing relationships destroyed. As we restore the relationships that man has broken, we are ultimately restoring man to his original state. Quote, Redemption is not a matter of an addition of a spiritual or supernatural dimension to creaturely life that was before. Rather, it is a matter of bringing new life and vitality to what was there all along. End quote. Renewal begins with a complete change in worldview. As Romans 12.2 commands, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve to what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Primarily, we should be teaching everyone how to image God. This includes introducing to the community the necessity for responsibility. As they build self-confidence, not only Excuse me. As they build self-confidence, and most importantly, confidence in God, they will be encouraged, therefore mobilizing their capabilities and potential to work. Secondly, Christians must seek to establish and rebuild relationships among local individuals, institutions, associations, churches, government, etc. God intended for the various individuals and institutions within communities to be interconnected and complementary. Many of us have different gifts. Therefore, if we work together as one, we would achieve more than we would separate it. As much as possible, we should be looking for resources and solutions to come from within the community, not from the outside. Poverty alleviation is a gradual assessment of the surrounding culture. There must be a focus to examine any possible consequences for conversion in whatever culture we are involved with. There must be time to grow relationship between us and those we are trying to help. If we fail to make sure these things are put into action, we are responsible for whatever consequences come hand in hand with that lack of thoroughness. We cannot take any chances in putting those we are trying to help in any form of vulnerability or harm. If these techniques are correct, then consequently there is a wrong way to alleviate poverty, and that is where the conflict arises. North Americans lean towards paternalism. Paternalism is the attitude or actions of a person or organization that gives people what they need, but does not give them any responsibility or freedom of choice. In the book, When Helping Hurts, Brian Fickert and Steve Corbett use a true story to explain this occurrence. A pastor to grow community in the area encouraged his congregation to volunteer by delivering Christmas presents to a nearby poor black community. Immediately, the program was successful, but over the years, the pastor struggled to find any willing volunteers. He called a meeting and asked his congregation why it had come to this point. At first, no one dared speak up, but after persistent questioning, one man confessed. He remarked, quote, Pastor, we are tired of trying to help these people out. We have been bringing them things for several years now, and their situation never improves. They just sit there in the same situation year in and year out. Have you ever noticed that there are no fathers in those homes? They're just a bunch of unwed mothers collecting bigger and bigger welfare checks. End quote. The man did have a point. The way that the church members were trying to help those poor members of the community was not helping, but in fact making things worse. The pastor found out that each time the church members would arrive at the doorsteps, the fathers of the families would run out the back doors. Quote. For a host of reasons, low-income African-American males sometimes struggle to find and keep jobs. This often contributes to a deep sense of shame and inadequacy, both of which make it even more difficult to apply for jobs. The last thing these fathers needed was a group of middle to upper class Caucasians providing Christmas presents 
for their children, presents that they themselves could not afford to buy. The intentions and attitude of the church is not what usually needs to be reformed. Problem arises when we analyze the techniques and results we are using in our sacrificial attempts to help. When it really comes down to it, good intentions are not enough. No matter how hard we try or all the blood, sweat, and tears we give, if we are not truly enhancing the impoverished, indigent, hellish, and destitute quality of life, what is it all for? Many say that it is self-righteous, conceited, and outright rude to be pointing out sin in other people's lives. Who are we to convict them, they say? Postmodernism is keeping the North American church from confronting cultural sins. It has introduced our world to relativism. People are led to believe that truth, good, evil, specifically sin, are all relative. We are afraid to point out any sin in anyone's life for fear of offending someone. However, in order to bring one's soul to the point of renewal, we must point out the sin in their lives. Exposing and correcting sin is the loving thing to do. It is an act of compassion and care because we are trying to stop them from pursuing a self-destructive path. I am not proposing that this plan I've suggested will completely eradicate poverty. I am proposing that it is a good and effective start to giving men and women who are suffering from indigence a healthier life mended by the Holy Spirit. In 1994, over the course of 100 days, over 2 million men, women, and children were violently murdered in the small country of Rwanda. During this time, every 60 seconds, six Rwandans would be slaughtered. After the horror ended in July, all that was left of the small country was rotting corpses, empty villages, and a hopeless people. Yet, incredible stories of profound forgiveness were soon known to the modern world, and survivors gave all credit of life to their savior God. Rwanda grew to be 94% Christian, and it seems that this is no coincidence regarding their radically cross-cultural behavior post-genocide. It is a beautiful example of recovery through a determined Christian worldview. Once massacre took its turn on the Rwandan people, poverty followed in its devastating footsteps. The nation, step by step, rebuilt itself. Because of the cultural acceptance and the regularity of forgiveness flowing from a Christian worldview, rehabilitation and renewal came soon after with a healthy presence. The Rwandan people worked to renew each and every relationship they were involved in. After years in jail, perpetrators confessed their sins to their maker and those they had wronged so horribly. Victims forgave without hesitation, enabling the rebuilding of the cultural community and the economic community as well. Since then, Rwanda has been the fastest growing economy in Central Africa. From one of the worst genocides in history came unfathomable renewal. Photographer Pieter Hugo and journalist Susan Dominus of the New York Times traveled to Rwanda 20 years after the genocide to interview survivors. For each interview and portrait, they chose a couple consisting of a perpetrator and a survivor. Here is one of the many stories of profound fulfillment of forgiveness and the implementation of restoring those stained relationships. A perpetrator confessed to Dominus. Quote. I, I burned her house. I attacked her in order to kill her and her children. But God protected them, and they escaped. When I was released from jail, if I saw her, I would, I would run and hide. Then I was provided with 
with trainings, and I decided to ask her for forgiveness, to have good relationships with the person to whom you did evil deeds. We thank God, end quote. In response, survivor Mukanyandwi said, quote, I used to hate him. <laughs> I, I used to hate him, but when he, when he came to my house, and knelt down before me and asked me for forgiveness. I was moved by his sincerity. Now, if I cry for help, he comes to rescue me. When I face any issue, I call him." End quote. When we engage with the poor, we must never forget that they are capable image bearers of Christ. We, as one unified creation of his, will lay our equal sins at the foot of the cross. If we are to attempt to alleviate the haunting curse of poverty, we must renew each and every relationship we have involved ourselves in, with God, with creation, with others, and ourselves. Let us do our utmost to not simply hand them the fish, but teach them how to fish. And most importantly, we must do all of it within a Christian worldview set on him. And our goal? To renew our brokenness through submission to our Father in heaven, to confess our prevalent sins, and to forgive and love others as our Savior loves us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you for that. I, I love reading your thesis. I love the heart that's behind this. Thank you. But I still have some questions. <laughs> I figured. Your thesis statement calls for cultural renewal as a better alternative to poverty alleviation than mere material aid. In the long version of your thesis, you give a few accounts of changed lives that are winsome, but I must admit that I remain unclear about what you mean by cultural renewal. In a sentence or three, would you explain this to me so that I can understand what this will look like practically? Absolutely. Well, um, so would you like me to defend culture and renewal for you? That's probably what you're asking. What, is, what, is, what does this look like practically? Cultural renewal. Right. Well, as a wise man once said, um, culture, is, as the aggregate of thought patterns, lifestyles, communications, societal mores, customs, values um, of a community or of people. Um, so let's picture that as culture. And then renewal to contribute to the transformation of all or some of those things through gospel informed, gospel empowered thought, communication, deeds, and attitudes. That is how um, I would define, um, define those terms. You probably recognize them. <laughs> um, well, uh, so is what, I'm, I'm a little unclear of what exactly you're asking. Are you asking me to explain what cultural renewal is? Practically, what will it look like? Practically. Um, in my thesis, I give examples or steps for um, for what I picture as cultural renewal. Um, that includes going into communities and building relationships with those people that takes time, um, that takes effort, um, opening up the door to personal responsibility to those people, equipping them with tools to sustain themselves. Um, like I say many times in my, in my thesis, does that, does that adequately? Thank you. Okay. The next question has, is actually, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a recovering Pharisee, and so bear with me as I ask this question. You began your presentation with an example from Cuernavaca, uh, Mexico. The American team you mentioned provided needed material. 
material aid. Of this you write, but they were not looking for a pair of broken spirits. They did not see the spiritual disorientation. They did not hear the desperate cry for the good news here at the version tonight also that you presented. Use those exact words. So I'm curious, how could that be known? How can a heart motivation of others be known and evaluated from afar and across half a century? Right, that, that's a great question. Um, in, this, in this speech and article, there is, Ivan Illich gives, talks about the people who have come through his organization, this organization on this exact trip and gave accounts of the interactions between those people um, and others. I, I believe what he's saying, their hearts are not at the wrong, in the wrong place most of the time. Sometimes, sometimes they are and they don't see the poor as equal human beings. But I'm saying that their attitudes and intentions and um, their hearts are not necessarily in, in a bad place. However, the way they are trying to implement that sacrificial love to these um, other cultures is hurting more more than helping. And I believe that if you have a heart for these people and you want to help them, um, you'd want to be enlightened on what you're actually doing. And I agree with that. That's, that's very good. Near the end uh, of your presentation, you talked about this difference between giving fish and teaching people to fish. So in emergency relief situations, which are numerous, doesn't the process of teaching people how to fish take a long time? You said it takes investment. You, you go in and you give your life. You argue that pressing needs should be met in a kind of manner. But how do you propose to distinguish emergencies in which you just give fish from the situations in which people can be taught to fish? In other words, where is the dividing line and how can a compassionate Christian see that line? Absolutely. In my written thesis, I define relief and development. Um, I define effective relief as um, effective, as quick um, and temporary. So when there is some sort of natural disaster, a human, um, a man-made emergency, that, that's what calls for immediate relief, bringing in resources that this whatever community does not have, what they need at the time, and they cannot provide for themselves at the moment. Directly after relief is not needed anymore, then we want to morph into development. And that, is, that means working with the community um, completely, not just throwing aid at them. Um, for example, Haiti, we, America um, and foreign aid has been providing um, rice and other sort of aid to Haiti because of the many natural disasters like hurricanes and earthquakes, yet they failed in the aspect of, of development. And there are, I watched a documentary called Poverty Inc. and they interview these Haitian men who say, stop, we don't, we don't want this anymore. We, we can work ourselves, we can grow our own rice. We needed it for the time being, but you're ruining our economy. Um, so there's a specific time and place for relief, and that's immediate. And then you, right after that's um, unneeded, go into development. And that's where the long process of building a relationship and teaching them how to do things for themselves begins. Great, thank you. If I may ask one more, and then I may pass this to someone else. You suggest that indigence results in a lack of shalom. Does this mean that hardship, poverty, and deprivation de facto mean a lack of shalom? I, um, I would say so because in I define in my also in my written version, indigence is a a life of pain. There's no peace. There's no enjoyment, and it's a extremely low quality of life. So by wanting to alleviate that. By alleviating poverty, we want to alleviate that pain, um, their physical and moral, or spiritual pain, excuse me. Um, so yes, I would say it is a lack of shalom entirely. Sin okay. overcomes it. So if, if I think you'll allow me to follow up. In 2 Corinthians 4, the Apostle Paul describes the affliction, perplexity, and persecution that he faced. And yet how he and his companions pressed on saying, we do not lose heart. He, he continues in 
continues uh, with these words, though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. Do you think that Paul and, and company had shalom or not? And is it possible for an indigent individual or community to have shalom in the midst of their indigence. Materially, we are all impoverished in different ways, whether that is spiritually or whether that is materially. And um, there are people who are living in the in some awful slum somewhere else or even in the impoverished um, areas in our nation today who have the joy of the Lord in them and have that peace I think materially that shalom, that peace is, um, is not present, but I believe that that peace of the Lord um, can be present in all situations. That's the, that's the power of Christ. Um, so, yeah, that's my answer. Okay. <laughs>